Well, good afternoon and welcome to our midweek devotion here at Christ Church. I'm Pastor Jay. I'm so glad you've chosen to join with me today, or if you're joining with us at a later time, I'm glad you're taking the time to you know, join in our uh, visual ministry of sharing the Word today. Uh, we continue in this glorious season of Easter. Epiphany is just around the corner here on Friday, and of course here at Christ Church, uh, again, this weekend, we'll be hosting our Boar's Head Festival. If you've not been able to be a part of that in the past, I hope you'll consider to do so. Uh, it's a wonderful time, a wonderful celebration and pageant of the birth of Christ in a kind of an old English way. And so uh, we invite you to participate in that. Uh, you can call into the church office if you'd like to uh, you know, get a ticket and join us on Friday or Saturday night for the festival. Uh, again, you can get in more information there. For our devotion today, I wanted to continue to sing a few Christmas carols while we're in the season. Of course, we can. Uh, this is one of an old carol that I, I've always loved. It's called, What Child Is This? What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christians fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, come peasant king to own him, the king of kings. Salvation brings that loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Again, thank you for joining me today. Let us now uh, share in a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, as we live into this wonderful season of Christmas, we know that uh, your light is shining among us. We know there are many things occurring in our community, in our world, that bring heartache and pain. But we know because of the child born long ago that that pain can be lifted and all sins forgiven. And for that, we give you our thanks. We pray you'd be with us today as we join in this time of devotion and worship and pray that your grace and peace might be upon all who join us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, uh, Epiphany is just around the corner. It's uh, January 6th is the a season of the day in the church year where we celebrate Epiphany. Sometimes we celebrate it on a Sunday that's closest to that. Uh, Epiphany has with it a lot of different uh, meanings, I guess, in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a wonderful celebration of the church, but part of it is an epiphany in, in a way is a, it is a revelation. You know, like I, I had an epiphany. Uh, I saw something. I understand things better. It's also very closely associated with the star. It's associated with light. It's, a, it's associated with uh, perhaps some of the most famous folks who, who visited the Christ child, being the, the wise men or the scholars, the folks that came from the east. We often uh, call them the three kings. Uh, 
and we remember and celebrate them. And so I wanted to share with you the word uh, that comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew about the visit from these individuals from afar. I'm reading from a contemporary translation. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because you will from from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me, so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went, and, and looked, the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling on their knees, they honored him. They opened their treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In my early years of ministry, I I had a magazine that I often read. I had a subscription to it. I've since let that subscription go. But it was a magazine called The Other Side. It was a wonderful magazine that often called and invited me and the, the readers to you know, think about gospel text differently, to think about our, our work in the world sometimes a little differently. But there was a story in it, and one of those issues, I, I don't know who wrote it, uh, but it was a story about the Magi. And it was a story that has always stuck with me. And so today is our way of reflecting upon the text I read regarding the kings or the magi, the wise men, whatever you want to call them. I want to share this story from the other side, which was titled, The Secret of the Gifts. Now, when the three travelers had arrived at the place where the baby lay, the first one to come forward with his gift was Gaspar. His cloak was made of finest velvet and trimmed with flawless fur. At his throat, he wore clusters of rubies and other precious stones, for Gaspar was a wealthy man. As he approached the stable, the people watching from afar saw him pause at the door. Many murmured among themselves, saying, he must be praying. But what they couldn't see was that there was an angel blocking the entranceway. It was the angel Gabriel. Who are you? Gabriel asked. I'm Gaspar. I've come to worship the king. All who enter here must have a gift, said the angel. Do you have a gift? Indeed I have, said Gaspar, lifting high a finely crafted box, which though small was quite heavy. I have brought bars of purest gold. Your gift must be the essence of yourself, said the angel something precious to your soul. And so I have, said Gaspar, with a smile across his lips. And shall it be, said the angel, as he moved to let Gaspar enter. And there before his eyes he saw the baby in the manger, his mother and earthly father looking on in still silence, the light of the sun coming through the window, glinting off the baby's shining eyes. Gaspar eased forward, holding out the box, offering it to the child. And as he bowed, suddenly the box changed before his eyes. Instead of a finely crafted box with its precious contents, he saw in his hands a rough-hewn iron hammer. What is this, he cried? What foul magic has come into this place? To which the angel replied, None but the magic of truth. For what you hold in your hands is the hammer of your greed. For you have used it to pound wealth from those who labor so you can live in luxury. You have used your wealth to build mansions while others live in hovels. 
And suddenly Gaspar knew the truth, and in humble sorrow and shame he turned to leave. But now the angel blocked his way, saying, No, you must leave it. You must offer your gift. Leave this? No, I cannot, Gaspar gasped. But you must. That is why you came. You have carried it for so many years, and your arms ache from its weight. And if you do not leave it, it will destroy you and those dear to you. But the hammer's too heavy. The, the child won't be able to lift it. He's the only one who can, said the angel. It's dangerous. He, he might hurt himself. That worry you must leave for heaven, said the angel. The hammer will find its place. So slowly, Gaspar eased forward again and, and laid the hammer at the baby's feet. He turned to leave and then glanced back at the child and exited the room. Those watching were surprised, for as he came out into light again, he raised his hands outstretched to heaven and a smile across his face. The next to come forward was Melchior, the learned Melchior. His robe was not as fancy as Gaspar's and was colored with the dark tones of a scholar. His long beard and furrowed brow spoke of precious to your soul, said the angel. And so it is, said Melchior. Then enter and we will see, said Gabriel. Melchior stood breathless in the awe of the scene in front of him. In all his years of study, he had never before felt or sensed such truth as he felt in the presence of the child. After a moment, he reached deep into the folds of his robes to bring forth the silver flask of precious ointment. As he did, suddenly he drew back and stared at the flask, for it was no longer in his hand. Instead, he held a rough clay bottle that would be found in the most humble of cupboards. He pulled the stopper and he sniffed and then stepped back. What is this, he cried. It's not frankincense I brought. I've been tricked. Someone changed it. It's vinegar. And so it is and so it shall be. You have brought what you are made of. You're an angel of fools, Melchior retorted. But the angel went on saying, you bring your bitterness of heart. You have carried it too long, the sorrow of old hurts and resentments. Sparks of anger have become embers burning in your soul. You have sought knowledge, but filled your heart with poison. As the angel spoke, Melchior's shoulders dropped, for he knew the words were true. Silently, he tried to place the bottle in his robe and shuffled toward the door. But the angel said, wait. You must leave your gift. Oh, how I wish I could, he said. How long have I longed to empty my soul of this bitterness? But I cannot leave it here at the feet of this child of love and innocence. But you can, and indeed you must, said the angel, for this is the only place you can leave it. But it's vile and bitter stuff. What, what if he should bring it to his lips and taste it? That worry you must leave to heaven, said the angel. So Melchior placed his gift before the baby. And they say when he came out, his eye shone brightly in the clearest light. His skin looked renewed and refreshed as he gazed at the heavens. There was still one visitor left, and he strode forward now. His back was straight as a tree, his shoulders firm as an oak. For this man, Belthazar, was a powerful warrior, the leader of many legions. In his hand, he carried a, a polished ebony box with bound, shiny brass. A murmur rippled through the crowd as he stopped at the door. Look, even mighty Balthazar stops before the child king, they said. But we know, of course, he stopped because of Gabriel, who again asked that question. Have you a gift? Of course, the soldier said. I bring myrrh, the most precious booty from my latest conquest. It is the essence of the rarest herbs. Yes, but is it the essence of yourself? Asked the angel. It is. Then you may enter. Even the fearless Balthazar was not adequately prepared for the sight before him. A wave of awe swept over him as his eyes fell on the Christ child. He bowed low and humbly made his way to the baby's feet. He closed his eyes as he slowly laid down the beautiful box 
and its precious ointments. But when he opened them, he saw lying before the child a spear with this razor-sharp blade glistening in the sunlight. It cannot be, he said. Some enemy has cast a spell. That is more true than you know, said the angel. For many thousands of enemies have cast their spell upon you and turned your soul into a spear. You talk in riddles, exclaimed the soldier king. Yet the angel continued, Living only to conquer, you have been conquered. Do you think I, I like to kill? asked Balthazar. You angels know nothing of the world. I'm a defender of my people. I protect and I serve. Were it not for my spear, we would have been defeated and destroyed long ago. Even now we're being threatened, and when I leave here, I must raise more armies and, and more weapons to save us. More? asked the angel. More than what? More than we have now? More than our enemies have? When you do, what will your enemies do? Will they too need more? Balthazar stopped and listening to the angel's words, realized these were questions he himself had asked. For a moment, he, he hesitated. Then he reached for the spear. No, my people need this, he said. Are you sure you can afford to keep it? asked the angel. But our enemies will destroy us if we drop our spears. We cannot take the risk. Yes, it is a risk, said the angel. But your way is a certainty. The certainty of spears and wars. Balthazar paused again after a long moment. He loosed his grasp on the shaft of the weapon. And as he did, he, he looked up at the angel. But is it safe to leave it here, he asked. It is the only safe place, said Gabriel. But he's a child. It, it could pierce his flesh. That fear you must leave to heaven, said the angel. They say when Balthazar came out of the stable in the light of the square, his, his arms were limp at his sides, tears running down his cheeks. Then he went to his fellow travelers, and they held each other in their arms like long-lost brothers. At least that's how the story has been told. But what of the gifts, you may ask? What of the hammer, the, the vinegar, and the spear? Well, they were used some years later on a lonely hill outside of Jerusalem. But that's another story for another day in the life of the Christ child. But that's not to worry. That's a burden which heaven took upon itself as only heaven can and will even to this very day. I've always loved that story. And my sisters and brothers, as we move towards Epiphany, this season where we remember the revelation of who God is, may we bring our gifts, the essence of who we are, and lay them at the feet of the child, recognizing even the, the shadow side, those darkest sides of ourselves, our, our greed, our our warlike nature, the, the bitterness that's in our hearts. He can redeem all of those. For indeed, that's what he came to do. Thanks be to God. Amen. For the closing song today, I want to use play one that I often play at the beginning because uh, it talks about being here to worship. But as we think about the Magi, the kings and their gifts, may we too come to worship this one who is the light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Well, here I am to worship, 
Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Now may the grace and peace of this God of love be with you as we all come into his presence, laying our gifts before the King. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.